This is the third currency that we've um, collaborated on. So it's a collaboration between Crying Out Loud and The Place. And it's really important because it gives us an opportunity to programme artists who otherwise we wouldn't necessarily be able to invite to London. The artists are often quite difficult to pinpoint. They're artists who sometimes mess with genres. So they could be in the world of dance or contemporary circus or performance or even live art. And I think the, the importance to the audience is that it gives us an opportunity to present work in a context that is European. We are constantly searching for artists at different festivals and across the UK and so it's really a fantastic platform for interesting, new, inspiring work where audiences are testing boundaries and really blurring, blurring the borders between art forms. We are deeply convinced of European collaboration. That means that we think uh, gathering young artists, people here, and um, having them here, uh, giving them the, the chance or the, the opportunity to learn from each other, to perform together, to talk to each other, uh, to perceive each other, makes it's a, big, it's a great benefit and makes them stronger and returning home to their countries they will benefit from this and the Goethe Institute is the link between often the link between an artist and an event so a um, uh, coming, uh, uh, coming event or a returning artist is always linked to the Goethe Institute so this year it's Nathalie Rekert Nathalie Rekert is uh, was born in Kassel in Germany and she's deeply influenced or inspired by, uh, was as a small uh, girl, as a small child, by the Chinese state circus. So what she's doing is mostly inspired or influenced by uh, acrobatics. And she's a very exciting and uh, young woman and uh, I'm very intrigued by her performances and art.
will ask you to leave the theater one more time and come back in after 60 seconds. If for some reason you find it hard to stand up or walk, you can stay seated and close your eyes until everybody is back inside. But if you can walk, then please go outside now and come back in after 60 seconds. <laughs> to get out there. I'm happy that you've all returned. You have just seen the first um, mechanical and social load experiment of tonight. I did this performance in Belgium a while ago and people didn't speak English and they didn't come back in. <laughs> in the next 45 minutes, we are going to test how durable a handstand, a bird, 
a violin and a human being are. Actually, it's not that hard to do a handstand. Doing a handstand is a little bit like trying to build a pyramid from eggs. Every egg has its own individual balance point and rolls away. But if you really take half an hour of time and focus on the balance point of each individual egg, you can build a pyramid from eggs. Even with one egg balanced right on top, I like the struggle in the handstand, and I like the attention I get from it. <laughs> when I do a handstand, I feel invincible, as if I'm about to turn into a rocket, flying through space. Or like a submarine, descending into its lonely world. When I do a handstand, I am someone special. It's not that hard to do a handstand. Doing a handstand is a little bit like trying to build a pyramid from eggs. Every egg has its own individual balance point and rolls away. It has its own spin, its own specific texture. balance point of each individual egg, you can actually build a pyramid from eggs.
Another mechanical load experiment. The material proved to not be very stable. We were dealing with eggs here, and then particularly wild hemp cells. organic vessel which offers a developing life form a protective shelter. Eggs are commonly laid by birds. Birds are vertebrates with a beak that are covered by feathers. Birds have two organs of balance, one in the ear and another one in the pelvic floor, which helps them to keep the balance while sitting on branches.
A handstand has four organs of balance. Two in the feet, one in the pelvic floor, and another one in the shoulders. A handstand is a pulsating shape made out of a head, a torso, two arms, and two legs. Different materials are used for the construction of the handstand. The body is made out of a red mixture which hardens from the load. The head is a balloon which can change its shape. It can reach a maximum expansion of three cubic meters. The legs are located at the top end of the torso. They serve as breezy stabilizers of the overall balance. The arms are located at the bottom end of the torso. They root the handstand to the ground and lead the weight directly away to the earth's center. The different parts of the handstand are held together by a protein which melts at 40 degrees. That is why you can take the handstand apart easily without breaking any of the individual parts. When I do a handstand, I feel like a fragile instrument with a complicated structure. I am Natalie and I like to do load experiments. I especially like to do load experiments with fragile structures and musical instruments. For example, with a violin. A violin is a string instrument that, can be, that produces sound by drawing a bow across one or more strings. In folk tales, violins often have a magical meaning. Someone who listens to the sound of the violin becomes enchanted and starts to dance, whether they want to or not. A violin consists of a soundboard, a back, a neck, and it also has ribs around the sides. The soundboard is the curved upper part with two F-shaped holes made out of very fine wood which improves with age. The back of the violin is also curved For the back and for the ribs, maple wood is used. The ribs connect the soundboard in the back and lead the weight directly away to the earth's center. At the top end of the soundboard, you can find the fingerboard. Ebony is the preferred material for it because of its hardness, beauty, and superior resistance. The sound of the violin is transmitted from the fingerboard through the strings directly into the peg box. The different parts of the violin are held together by an animal hide glue, which melts at 40 degrees. That is why you can take the violin apart easily without breaking any of the individual parts. I am Natalie and I like to do load experiments. I also like to wrap up my handstand table in sandwich paper because it makes such a nice crisp sound and it reminds me of the breaking eggs. I like to do handstands. I especially like to do handstands on this handstand table, which looks like a gymnastic equipment, because I'm the master of this equipment, and 
It makes no sense for me to do handstands on anything else. <laughs> Apart from that, I like to do load experiments with hot melted chocolate, almonds, peanut butter, pieces of licorice and sugar icing with bananas. I mix everything together, put it in the freezer, wait for a bit, take it out again, throw it on the floor and have a look at what shape it takes. I also like to mix together truffle mayonnaise and bananas with almond butter and even more sugar with cinnamon, cinnamon rolls and honey and chocolate, pieces of chocolate, dark chocolate, melted toffee and mayonnaise with
are used in the construction of the human being. First, hot chocolate is added to the body. When the chocolate hardens, pieces of licorice can be attached left and right as the arms and legs. The last thing that is added is a cherry that sits on top instead of the head. The different parts of the human being are connected by sugar icing, which melts at 20 degrees. That is why you can take a human being apart easily without breaking any of the individual parts. However, if a person is subject to different kinds of mechanical, social, or fictional loads, a slowly progressing material fatigue can occur. Fatigue is the progressive and localized structural damage that occurs when a material is subject to frequent loading. Even if the maximum stress values that cause such damage are never reached. Part of the construction may fail completely. A piece of licorice, for example, can be bent back and forth many times. However, with the number of bendings, the likelihood of a fracture increases. I 
I'm always happy to have arrived at this part in the piece without having suffered any structural damage. <laughs> I'm Natalie and I like to do handstands because when I do a handstand I feel invincible, like a rocket, as if I was made from steel, or fragile, like an egg, or sweet and bendy, like a piece of licorice. When I do a handstand, I am someone special for you and for me. I'm Lindsay Winship, I'm the dance critic of the Evening Standard, and I'm delighted to be joined by Johan Flock, who leads the Fresh Arts Coalition in Europe, aka FACE, and Ben Duke, who's a performer under the guise of Lost Dog, and you may have seen his brilliant one-man dance theatre version of Paradise Lost, um, which is still touring, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So if you haven't seen it, you must. <laughs> um, and we are here to talk about uh, genres and cross fertilization and different art forms merging together and what that means for artists and for audiences and for venues. Um, I assume we're all going to see the currency performance tonight and that's a season which it's very hard to put a label on. I mean, you have artists who come from dance and theatre, uh, from circus, from hip hop and spoken word, I think some with academic backgrounds, sometimes all in one show. It's a real mix of performers. And I think it's quite interesting to ask what those artists have in common as well as what their differences are and whether the bringing together of different forms is growing new art forms within that and what kind of considerations might we then have to make for artists and audiences. Um, I mean, no, lots of artists, I think, would say that they don't want to be labelled and they don't want to be pigeonholed and the idea of whether you are a dancer or a theatre maker or, you know, it's immaterial. But certainly for me as a journalist, there are, it's a practical matter you know, who's going to write about this piece. You need a shorthand to communicate with audiences sometimes, especially when, as I often have for a review, you have 200 words to write. You know, you can't, you do need shorthands for communication. When I used to work at uh, Time Out magazine, we would get press releases pinging into our inboxes and then people shouting across the room, is this one your, is this theatre? Is this dance? Is this kids? You know, and, and, and sort of, uh, you would have discussion about what this art form was. And I'm sure people who go to see theatre have that same discussion in their own way. Um, and I've certainly seen in dance, which is the, the world that I know best, 
artists looking for new modes of communication, um, feeling that dance alone can't always express all the things specifically that they want to express. Um, and they're looking to new modes of communication for that. Although, interestingly, I was talking to Akram Khan the other day, and he had made quite a few works with a lot of speaking in them. Uh, but he said in his new piece, no speaking, he felt like that had become a trend. He didn't want to be part of a trend anymore. Um, and he was sort of half joking, but only half joking, I think. So it was interesting that you know, he really felt that, I, I think, th that had been written about as a trend, and thus he no longer wanted to be part of it. Um, so I, but I, I think it's more than just a trend, um, but that's what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to chat for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then I'll open up for questions, and perhaps we can just have more of a discussion, because I'm sure you'll all have lots of questions and ideas and things you would like to add. Um, so, Johan and Ben, I thought it would be nice just to start with each of you talking about what has, what, do, what does the definition of different art forms mean to you in your work? and the sort of cross-fertilization or moving between different art forms. Are there, are there boundaries or what has that meant for you? I mean, Ben, I know that you, you trained in dance and also in theater, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah. did you feel they were two very separate worlds? Um, yeah, I did. I, I, I felt like they were very separate worlds and probably that was my, yeah. That, when I think about genres, I, I feel like certainly the training in this country is very um, divided along those those lines, uh, the, it was strange because the, the, the practices of the, the drama school compared to the dance school, they were very different environments in terms of the people, almost like, almost like the tribes of people who belong to each of those places. You could kind of recognize them by their clothes and by their, um, <laughs> yeah, by their willingness to kind of sing musicals in their lunch break. And, <laughs> Think, you know, things that were very different, like uh, there was a kind of, um, I mean, an, an obvious difference in terms of volume of, of words in both the, the kind of environment of those buildings and also in the, in, the, in the training itself. But I felt really surprised when I came to dance school and, and I felt that difference. I was like, we're all dealing with performance and yet the way we're dealing with that is, is so different. Drama school was constantly every single day dealing with the idea of being on a stage. Every lesson somehow had that built into it. And then the dance training was very much about a studio-based practice and a kind of something that was, um, yeah, performance was almost kept somewhere else. The stage was somewhere else and we were getting ready for it, but we weren't going to deal with it yet. Yeah. We weren't going to deal with it for a while. And so I found that surprising because I was like, these, we're both talking about going on stage, but the way we're looking at these things is, is, is very, very different. And that felt quite English to me. I don't, I don't have so much experience of, but it felt like there was this kind of, there was a lot of, um, it's, not, it's not snobbery, but there was a lot of kind of, that's not my thing. When, you know, the movement classes at drama school, that's not my thing. I don't, I don't want to get involved with that. I want to sit around the table and I want to talk about my intention and my micro intention and my whatever smaller than that. And uh, the, the kind of, the, there were those conversations and the movement was like, no, it's a, it's a separate thing. And I found myself pulled towards that separate thing, feeling like, no, this is, uh, this is, this is the thing for me anyway. So I found that tr that training was, was really um, forming my ideas, I suppose, a a as an artist. And it was when I got to the end of my drama training that I started thinking about the companies that I wanted to work for and realizing that they were all quite physical and realizing that my drama training hadn't really given me that, mm. those tools. So I was like, OK, so this is a separate genre this is a separate thing that i now need to train for and and then, then coming out of that second training thinking like there's there's so much overlap here and yet they seem to exist in very in in completely different worlds with different personnel different uh venues different yeah. rituals and um so in a way the difference is more about structure than art yeah for me absolutely and 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 the it was surprising, and I know that I know when I came, when I, I trained here at London Academy Dance School, there was talk of this uh, partnership with RADA, 
I don't know, I'm looking around to see if there's anyone from the school before I cause offence. But uh, there were, it, it was there on paper, but it, it didn't exist, really. There, was, there wasn't, you know, people were talking about it, but there wasn't really. And so, it, yeah, it was about that mm. separate thing that I was like, we are actually involved in a very, well, the same thing. We're talking about going on stage and why, why are these things um, so separate. Mm. But for the kind of work you wanted to make, you needed both of those elements. Yes, yeah. I mean, I didn't really know that at the time. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I, I, I needed both of those elements. And um, I'm very glad that my training took that peculiar path. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And Johan, what, what led to the formation of FACE? And why is, is that needed? Because by my understanding, you're working with lots of cross arts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, exactly this, actually, that more and more that the artists are against the idea of being labelled and they don't want to be labelled and, and they're not feeling comfortable with the idea of being defined by just one genre, one art form. And uh, even if they, they are by journalists, by critics, by presenters, by many promoters from industry, marketing people, they, 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 they know they have to, to have this kind of tag like I'm coming from this. Usually it's the educational training they got that put them in, yeah. in a specific category. And, and I've been working in, in the circus, contemporary circus field for years, uh, and, and this is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, training, performing. I don't want to, to hear a lot about the text, spoken mm. words, not mm. my thing, you know. Mm. But, and it's interesting that in their career, they evolved and embraced physical theater and all kind of uh, 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 forms of expression, including spoken words, and feel very at ease then, but still are defined by their training and mm. the education they, they've been through. Face came from this idea that uh, 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 it's not what we call an advocacy network. Uh, the idea was not to defend the, 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 the circus, the dance field, or whatever, but really to, to witness and observe the, what's on stage, uh, what's available, what's existing, what's, what the artists want to develop, what kind of work they want to do. And basically, many of them want to develop cross-disciplinary hybrid forms. Uh, so the idea was not to have an industry look at what was existing or the different categories, but have a look of what the artists are expressing. Mm. Um, I would say that uh, the network really focuses on all the, what I call the slash aesthetics. Mm. So the idea that you have the dance slash physical theater slash new media or the circus slash theater slash whatever. So you always have these uh, big difficulty to define the work you, you're seeing, mm. um, which is a kind of gray area. Uh, we don't know very well if it's live art or dance or physical, whatever. But obviously, the, 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 the work produced is really highly interesting. And this hybridity or the, the cross genre add a value to the work and definitely the artist feel very at ease in exploring these edgy parts of their creation I would say. Yeah. Because it's not some I mean it's not something new, is it? No. The idea of I mean I would say that at the beginnings of arts forms, nothing was a you know, nothing was a pure art form. Art forms have rarely oh, yeah. existed purely alone and certainly I mean I was thinking I there's, there's an article on the tables one. Um, I was thinking about things like pantomime and sort of ballet coming out of court masks. And, you know, these were never pure art forms. Um, but I think perhaps as art forms became more professionalized, they have divided and more sort of institutionalized, perhaps. But then, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, there was tons of experimental work. Mm, and yeah, yeah. you would think that boundaries were kind of blasted mm. out the window. But yet it's still a talking point. Why do you think that is? Statement. I mean, artists were like. If you see Peter Brook early work, you, you see the, the the blurry, the the boundary is not really existing. And the same for many many theatre makers, many uh, contemporary circus companies, etc. So these these lines were not existing. But uh, I would say today, a lot of artists state that they are not. They don't want to belong to one category. And this is the big difference. 
uh, during years, artists were very proud to say, I'm, <coughs> I'm a dancer, I'm a choreographer, I'm nothing else. And same for all the art forms. But the idea that uh, since, I don't know, late 90s, artists really defend the idea they don't belong to just one category. Mm -hmm. They really write about it and, and are very loud about this and try to even change policies or arts council strategies uh, you know, to have a more transversal view of what is contemporary performing arts. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's. I think you're right. There's something about the training or the systematizing of things, which mean that we they they are divided and there's kind of specialization, which seems odd. But also, it feels like you have to ha things have to exist for a while before someone gives it a genre. You know, like. Uh, it's not the first show of that thing that someone goes, ah, I know exactly what that is, but what you've seen it 12 times, and like in music, someone will come up with a name for it mm, simply yeah. because they're bored of trying to do the, you know, several slashes to describe it. They're like, let's call it this. So it feels like, particularly in, I guess, contemporary dance and contemporary circus, where it feels like there's a very, you know, they're kind of new worlds, and that's what's great about them. They don't have this big weight of history and form that kind of sits on them so that. The, these things are kind of, they're new and maybe, but like you say, the, the idea isn't new. It's not like, I don't think people are feeling uh, like we're, we, you're reinventing the wheel. You're still talking about people on stage yeah. in front of people in seats. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't know why that, I mean, I, I feel like there's this, this, as an artist, it's almost like now we are, yeah, you know, the conversation is like, we don't want to be defined by it. And the conversation from the audiences or the promoters is kind of the other side, like, just get over yourself and tell us what it is so we can, <laughs> you know, tell people about it. So it feels like there's this kind of divide in this, yeah. you know, we'll take up our position. And I, and I, I, I get that as well. But I, I also feel like, yeah, you know, um, sometimes we, we risk making it sound far more uh, unrecognizable than it actually is is you know it's not it's it's yeah. it's not always uh it's not something that's going to scare you and you're going to walk in there and there's going to be a whole set of things you don't recognize it's just simply the arrangement of them perhaps or the, or the fact that you're moving between these kind of different mediums that is uh is the thing but um do you feel like you belong in a any particular world uh yeah, I mean, I, I think I do belong in the dance world, and I feel I do feel proud of that world, and I feel like that is when I stepped into this building, that was the world where I was like, ah, these are my people, mm -hmm. this is my tribe, and I still feel that, and I feel very supported by the dance world. But ever since we started, I started making work. I was like, but I want to get the work into theatres because I want, I I I think the work is. Uh, good most of the time and I, and I think that it's you know I think that there's not there's nothing here which is going to make this hard for a theatre audience to understand mm -hmm. so so that division I find difficult but I still feel a, a, I suppose a loyalty or a kind of um, my base even when the work involves perhaps less and less dance it still feels like the processes and the things that I've um, the way I make work is is from is from I recognize that tradition yeah. from the dance world, mm. I suppose. Is it also because there are bigger audiences in theatres, in the yeah. theatre world? Yeah, I mean, that's appealing. I mean, appealing. it makes sense. Yeah, you, yeah. Make work, you want people to see it. You want people to see it, yeah. You want people to see it, and you, and, and, uh, you want it to be able to come out of its box. I mean, that's what we're talking about, I guess. Like, you, you, you want the work, even if I come from this place, I want it to be, yeah, which is happening with other companies, for it to be seen outside of the, the dance world. Yeah. Yeah, and tell me a bit more about our view is quite UK specific, but I mean, compared with other countries in Europe, do you feel other people are as stuck to their definitions as perhaps we are here? Yes and no. I, I, I have an example listening to you of a French director uh, who was one of the founding member of the quite a uh, big successful Nouveau Cirque company, uh, Stéphane Ricordel. He's now the director of um, uh, Montfort, which is a, a theater venue in Paris. And he's still creating work, directing work. 
And it's funny because whatever work he creates, it always labeled the work circus as a statement saying, I'm coming from, mm -hmm. from the circus. I had this training and background. And even if I'm doing theater, the, the, the process is from the mm. circus. So the devising process of the piece is a circus process, uh, which I find very interesting also as, a, as an artistic statement mm. in a way. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if uh, internationally I, uh, I, could, I could like draw some, 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 some trends mm -hmm. in this. What I can say is more and more what I see from both sides, from the artistic uh, Point or community point of view, but also from the funders and, and policymakers' point of view, the interdisciplinary combined arts, whatever you call mm. it, is growing. And this idea that uh, to to focus on on one uh, genre art form is really less relevant than before. So of course, it makes it difficult for the emerging art forms because hip hop or circus or whatever young art forms need specific, I would say, support. Uh, again, because uh, hip-hop processes are not the same one as the circus or the dance. So, and the infrastructure, structuring, the professional development, all these small or big schemes to, to make an art form grow are quite specific. And many funders consider, well, now everything is mixed, so let's do it transversal, which usually tend to, I mean, leads to the dance and the theater being supported and all the rest and all the emerging artists or emerging conceptual experimental work being less supported, which is a reality in right. most of the countries when, where these strategies take place. Um, and in some parts of the world, and, and uh, we organized with FACE a, a visit to Seoul, uh, Korea, meeting with policymakers, uh, everything contemporary is interdisciplinary arts. Okay. So you have traditional, and then everything else is interdisciplinary. And then it's quite interesting also perspective for funders yeah. saying, okay, it's not traditional music or theater, so it should be contemporary, so it should be in this big pot of money or whatever, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, funders, sometimes comes with a, a quite fresh views on so. Mm. It's interesting you say that because you could have the same discussion yeah. about classical and modern work or ballet yeah, yeah. and contemporary dance yeah. and how actually, you know, the boundary between that is certainly blurring. You know, you will see uh, at the Royal Ballet in any triple bill, you'll see a piece that is more like contemporary dance. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where, the, where you draw the lines there mm. is becoming interestingly blurred, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Where do you think there are particularly rich areas of cross visualization going on? I mean, between dance and circus, perhaps, or dance and visual art, or dance and theatre. Where are you seeing really interesting work? I think that what we call the live art, because it, 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 it encompasses everything. Uh, and you have more and more artists from dance, from theatre, from circus, that propose artwork that are so so difficult to label and everybody kind of agree to say it's a live art installation or live art performance that could go in art galleries or museums or whatever in train station mm -hmm. so this idea that the, the yeah live art feel is is growing and and i would say even the live art people that started to build that small field or niche field are, are feeling a bit like pissed or sad saying no this is not live art <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what you're Purists. talking about yeah yeah kind of mm. thing but yeah definitely very right. interesting that's interesting yeah. mm. what do you think ben um i don't know if i could identify a kind of area i mean certainly being up in edinburgh this year i was the shows that i loved were the ones that i couldn't get a handle on or that or that I would struggle to describe, or, or, or that we, we, we kind of felt like they were messing with my expectations, you know. This show that I saw that started with this beautiful kind of, it, yeah, it, it almost was a live, you know, someone drawing almost like this beautiful calligraphy on this, on this screen standing behind it, and you, it takes you into this expectation of where you're gonna go with this show, and then 30 seconds later, these kind of four guys come on stage and start playing the loudest, kind of shouting through a megaphone, this kind of, 
incredibly in your face music and suddenly you're like oh we're not going there we're going over <laughs> here and, and they you feel like they've skillfully messed with your sense of what genre you're sitting in and and, and yeah I found that I found that thrilling I felt like I mean Edinburgh really inspired me mm. in that sense I was like wow there's people out here who are just another beautiful show with a guy just showing us photographs and everyone's like is that theater what is that it's just some guy talking with his photos and but it also is theater it's a, it's yeah. a wonderfully intimate kind of piece of storytelling and you find yourself moved you know it, it is it is theater because of its context but it's like uh, I wouldn't like to be involved in that discussion of trying to pin down yeah. that thing, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. whatever, it's great, you know, it's just great, so let's... Uh, yeah, know, well, subverting so expectations is a theatrical device in itself. But, sure. but I wanted to ask you about Edinburgh, actually, because there you're much less defined by what venue you're in often, and the audience, you know, they might pick things at random or mm. whatever's been reviewed and probably have fewer expectations than coming to a show in London. Did that, did that make a difference to you? Um, yeah, I mean... I don't know if it's I, noticeable. When yeah, I think... Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, definitely when you go up to Edinburgh, I have the, I have the fear of the kind of... You know, because each section of the brochure is colour-coded. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I, I know there's a lot of people who will not even open the dance and physical theatre <laughs> section. They will look at theatre and they'll look at comedy maybe, but they won't go into that section. <laughs> like, it's some kind of weird territory. But... So that always makes me nervous, and, and they're like, "What do you want to call the show?" And I think we even spoke about it. Where do we want to, where do we want to put this? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I feel like after you know a week or ten days in Edinburgh, that stuff kind of gets forgotten, and it's about what the shows that people are talking mm -hmm. about. And again, I love I love that that happens in Edinburgh. It's a word of mouth recommendation place, and you don't hear people discussing the genres of the work. Yeah but they're talking about what's good. Yeah. yeah, and that's what's good about Edinburgh when you do a long run, because yeah. you have time to do that, Yeah. which often for dance performances in London, which might be a couple of nights or a piece of contemporary sure. circus or something, you don't have the time to build no. that word of mouth, so you're still just going on what's in the brochure, yeah. assuming you pick the brochure up in the first place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, think the, I think the idea of the effect for audiences is quite interesting, what audiences are expecting to see or whether it that that matters if they have sort of mm. prior expectations. What do you think? Yeah, I think it. I think it does matter for a lot of people that that sense of uh, yeah. What What are you expecting? And if you're coming in to Paradise Lost expecting a you know an hour and a half of dance, then that's probably going to be disappointing for you. And that's yeah, that's that's a difficult thing to manage. And I, and I. I don't know how that, I was talking recently to people who are part of the rural touring scheme and they were saying that it's, it's incredibly important for that project as well to be able to give people an idea of what they're going to come and see. And I think, yeah, the, the, you, are, you are setting up an expectation and you've got to try and do that as, uh, as well as you can without having to describe exactly what happens in the show from minute to minute. Um, and I have to say, I, at that point, I tend to kind of step back from it and go, I can, I can talk about my work as, you know, usually in a very convoluted, confusing way. And if we want to talk about the genres, I probably need someone else who's seen the show to tell me, <laughs> what, what do you want to call it? What, what are the words that are, you, think, you think describe this piece of work? And let's, let's go with that. And, uh, yeah. But do we watch different art forms in different ways, do you think? I, I, yeah, probably. Uh, but for example, uh, back to Edinburgh, mm. uh, when you see their Total Theatre Awards every year, you're quite surprised and would, I mean, everybody would have quite a lot of difficulties to, to label the work that is uh, saluted. Um, uh, and every year I check the, 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 the awards and we know quite a lot of work and I'm watching uh, Rachel Claire from Cray Out Loud. Uh, yeah, very difficult to, to labor the work and very difficult to, I mean, to put these, uh, these shows in, in just one box, I would say. Um, I, I, I agree that it's, it's, it's interesting to, to explain or to give a taste of the work, not necessarily to put it in a box defining the genre. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, for all the communication and marketing people working in venues and festivals, the idea is more to to give 
I mean, to, to yeah, to give the appetite we say in French to uh, to give uh, the audience yeah, or potential flavor. audience members the opportunity to grasp the performance or the the idea of the show or who is performing or where do they come from, etc. Not necessarily to define the genre mm. of of the of the performance mm. uh, itself. And I, th I think this is the challenge also, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the new challenge for all these. Uh, these uh, dedicated people that try to sell tickets mm -hmm. is to actually try to reach the audience, but not by the genre anymore, but more by the, mm -hmm. yeah, the context, the yeah. history, the personal history. Yeah, I know that yeah. you had a discussion about filming earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's, I suppose that's one way that people are sometimes trying to get a, convey the essence of a work without having to say what it is. Mm -hmm. um, being able to suggest a mood or, you know, show some movement or, give that kind of flavour. And also because I guess that the many audience members or many citizens have a quite strong prejudice against contemporary dance or light art or circus. Mm -hmm. For circus they expect the clowns and the elephants, for contemporary dance they expect something very elitist they, mm. they cannot access, etc, yeah. etc. Et so sometimes not to use these words or these genres can be quite interesting. Mm. I used to that. think I didn't like juggling. I was very firm on that, but actually, I've seen some things that have changed my mind. <laughs> the I just uh,
So, you made it to Planet Dance. Welcome. Hmm? Now, you may be far from home, but please don't feel like a stranger in a strange land. True, the planet may look a little alien and its inhabitants can behave oddly, but just remember, dancers are humanoids, just like you. Right now, hmm? you're probably thinking, where should I visit? What are the local customs? Is there a map? A phrasebook? This guide aims to give you some practical answers, useful advice, and help in getting around. Mm. So relax, have fun, and enjoy your stay. Mm. You're on holiday from planet Earth now. Welcome <laughs> to Planet Dance. Mm. Planet Dance is about the same size as Earth, although much more sparsely populated. You've arrived in the zone commonly called Contemporary Dance. And this is where we'll mostly be staying on this trip. But first, it's worth taking a look around mm. to get our orientation. Mm. The first thing you'll notice is that everything moves. Not just the people, but the places too. The whole planet is made up of currents, some broad and slow moving, some fast and changeable. That's why maps of planet dance can look like charts of the sea. They're designed to help you navigate your way around, not tell you exactly what is where. Cartographers have commonly identified two poles on planet dance, performance dance and social dance. Towards the social pole are regions such as folk dance, club dance and ballroom dance. Inhabitants tend to be more interested in participating than in showing and watching. But go towards the performance pole, and the division between performer and spectator becomes a much bigger deal. You can think of it like this. Social dance is basically a special part of life. Performance dance is a special part of theatre. Contemporary dance lies towards the performance pole. But before we start settling in, let's take a look at who else is around here. A big neighbour is ballet. Where the dancers make long lines with their bodies. And have a look of lightness. They often tell of myths and fairy tales. And how different women are from men. Hmm. Ballet is just one of the many regions that border contemporary dance. And looking around, you can see a profusion of other styles, characters, and customs. Now, let's take a look at the people here in contemporary dance. They are a very mixed bunch. Many have arrived here from somewhere else altogether. In fact, the one thing these dancers have in common is their love of travelling. They like exploring, finding new places, discovering new things. So you might meet someone who started over in street dance and studied in ballet before landing up here in contemporary. They come here because it's a place which prizes experimentation, invention and non-conformity. They are a mixed and unsettled group. Their search for the new can make contemporary dances unpredictable. But many visitors like them for that very reason. It's what gives them their edge. So, there you have the basic geography of planet dance. Just remember that the whole place is on the move. Don't be surprised. Dancers are always moving. It's what they do. Mm. Now you have a sense of orientation. Great. But you might be wondering, what if someone tries to communicate with me? How can I understand them? Mm? Don't worry. 
We take a look at these questions in the next episode. Body Talk. <laughs>